we're going to turn now to labor dimensions and follow exactly the same uh, same analysis. Okay, so uh, let's redraw our diagram. Y axis, X axis, and then the size of the labor force. Okay. And then we have our tightness on the y-axis, we have employment on the x-axis, we have the size of the labor force H here, we have our labor supply, or we have our zero here, we have our labor supply, we have theta M, Here, where labor demand is zero, then we have a labor demand curve, which is decreasing in tightness. We have our equilibrium here. So this is the tightness prevailing on the labor market. This is the equilibrium point. This is equilibrium level of employment, L. Right, so it's exactly our setup, and then you know we have our uh, unemployment level that's given here. So if we want, which is a gap between L and H. That's the unemployment level U. Okay. Um, so now we're going to study uh, what happens if we have an increase. In A, uh, which is labor productivity, and that's going to be a labor demand shock because it's going to affect the labor demand and not the labor supply. All right, so uh, increase in A. Uh, well, we have to go back to our expression for the labor demand just for a second. If we go back up, right, so we can see here if we increase A, uh, 1 minus gamma. This is strictly positive because gamma is strictly less than 1. A is going to go up. A to the power of 1 minus gamma, that's going to go up. Nothing moves here. This exponent here is positive. And so we know that if A goes up, the level of demand uh, for any level of tightness is going to be higher. So an increase in labor productivity is going to boost labor of demand, which is not surprising if suddenly workers become more productive, it's more profitable to hire workers and so firms are going to scale up and hire more workers. So here what we've used is that 1 minus gamma is positive, which is uh, going to be key. Alright, so if we have an increase in productivity, that's going to boost our labor demand. Okay, so the so labor demand is going to take a new shape, something like this. So that's going to be our new level demand. Okay, so what's going to happen? So once again, the tightness, once we are here, the tightness has to adjust in equilibrium. Uh, so now we have a higher, higher level demand. So level demand curve shift outside, and so we'll have a new equilibrium that's going to be here. And at that new equilibrium, the tightness is going to be at a higher level. We have theta prime, that's at a higher level. What happens to employment? Well, clearly, employment is also going to be higher, so we have more tightness, we have more employment. What happens to unemployment? Well, unemployment is a gap between employment and the size of the labor force here, so the, lo the number of people in the, who are unemployed here is clearly smaller. Uh, okay? So, this is what happens. We have a rotation out of the labor demand, which is going to allow us to have a uh, more workers employed, a higher tightness, and uh, fewer workers were unemployed. Okay, so that's the impact of a positive labor demand shock. Okay, that's very simple to see. So very different impact than what we saw 
uh, with a positive labor supply shock. In both cases, the level of employment goes up, but here the tightness goes up instead of going down. And so the number of unemployed goes down instead of going up. So very different prediction. So let's summarize what we have when we have an increase in A, the labor productivity, which is positive labor demand shock. So positive because it tends to stimulate um, the economy. Okay, so what happens? So if you increase A, employment is going to go up. Okay. So both employment level, employment rate, the size of the labor force doesn't change here. Tightness, as we've said, is going to go up. What happens to the unemployment rate? So U is the unemployment rate, again it's S divided by S plus F of theta. If tightness goes up, F of theta is going to go up. So S divided by S of S plus F of theta is going to go down. So the unemployment rate is going to fall. So, um, so here our increase in A gives us an increase in employment, tightness, a drop in the unemployment rate. What happens to the level of unemployed? Big U, well, that's just the unemployment rate times the size of the labor force. Size of the labor force doesn't change. So the number of workers who are unemployed is also going to drop. Okay. So here I should say, given that the number of workers who have a job goes up, that's what we would label a boom or an expansion, okay, which would be the opposite of a slump or a recession. Okay, so here we are looking at uh, the positive uh, part uh, of a business cycle, what we call also a business cycle peak sometimes. Okay, uh, all right. So. That's great. Or oh, what happens to vacancies, right? We always, uh, when we looked at the entire televisions, we always graph that beverage curve that shows our unemployment rate and vacancy rates are moving together. Or here, given that the size of the labor force doesn't change, how the number of unemployed and the number of vacancies move together. Uh, well, actually, this is pretty simple to see. Um, you remember that here we're studying labor market in which uh, flows are always balanced, right? So we are. Uh, we are looking at the labor market once the size uh, of the pool of unemployed and the size of the pool of employed worker is uh, stable, right? So we have balanced flows. We always focus on this situation and as we had discussed, even if for a short amount of time the flows are not balanced, the labor market is going to converge um, actually pretty quickly towards the situation where flows are balanced. So we approximate what happens on the labor market by only looking at a situation with balanced flows. So if flows are balanced, we know what that means. It means that the um, inflows into unemployment are equal to the outflows from unemployment. Now, what are the inflows into unemployment? The inflows into unemployment these are people who lose their job and the job separation rate is S. The number of people who have a job is L. So these are our inflows. What are the outflows? Well, the outflows are the people who are unemployed who find a job. So basically it's all the new uh, job worker matches that are created. And that's given by the matching function. So actually the total number of outflows is the matching function with U, the number of unemployed, V, the number of vacancies, right? Where this M is our matching function. So this is always true. So now what happens once uh, labor productivity uh, goes up? So we know that uh, the number of employed goes up. So this is going to go up, okay? As the job separation rate doesn't move, the matching function doesn't move. We also know that once productivity is higher up, um, the labor demand, you know, has been stimulated, the number of unemployed is going to fall. So you have fewer unemployed, okay? So this equation here, the balance flow equation, has to remain true. The right-hand side is at a higher level. The argument u into the matching function is lower. Uh, so what must happen to v for this equation to be true? Well, it has to be that the number of vacancies goes up. Because if the number of vacancies went down, 
since the number of unemployed also went down, for sure the number of new matches M of UV would go down. But that, then the equation couldn't be true because if you have fewer matches here and you have to create, you have to balance inflows that have become larger, the so S times L, this can't continue to hold. So the only way that these equations continue to hold even after the change in productivity is that the number of vacancies here uh, goes up. Otherwise you can't, your equation won't, uh, won't be able to hold. Okay? So from this little piece of uh, reasoning, what we learn is that the V, the number of vacancies is going to grow up. And of course the vacancy rate, which is just V divided by H, the size of the labor force and H as it moved, uh, is also going to grow up. So now in, in an expansion that's created by higher labor productivity, you're going to have more vacancies and a higher vacancy rate. Okay? So here what we've generated with these productivity shocks, uh, so what we've shown is that under shocks to um, labor productivity or technology, whatever you call it, What do we have? So we have that the uh, so when in good times here we can see that the tightness is high in good, when you have a boom. So we infer that tightness is going to be procyclical. Means it boom, it moves together with the uh, business cycle. You can see that vacancies are also up, including the vacancy rate. So the vacancy rate. V is also procyclical. The unemployment rate on the other end, as we saw here, is going down, so it's going to be counter-cyclical. Okay, so this is exactly what we wanted. We have counter-cyclical unemployment rate. And furthermore, uh, we have a procyclical tightness. And when the unemployment rate is high, the vacancy rate is low. When the vacancy rate is low, is high, the, vacancy, the unemployment rate is low because V is procyclical. So here we also have, uh, of course, a beverage curve. Implicitly, because when you have uh, as the labor productivity move, when you have a high unemployment, you have a low tightness. When you have a, a low vacancy rate, when you have a high vacancy rate, you're going to have a low uh, unemployment rate, like here in good times. So we've also generated a beverage curve. So under these shocks to productivity, we've, able, we've been able to match everything we see in the data. Uh, in good times, we see a low unemployment, high vacancies, uh, high tightness. In bad times, we see high unemployment, low vacancies, low tightness. So these shocks to productivity, they seem to, you know, in a matching model, that describe the data very, um, very well. Um, that's a key conclusion here. So in a matching model, shocks to um, productivity, to labor productivity, they generate a realistic business cycles. Okay. So great, so now we have our model and you know and of course here something that's key is of course is under something that we've used is under rigid uh, wages. Okay, so we've assumed rigid wages, we've plugged in labor productivity shock, and we've been able to generate fluctuations that look like what we see in the data uh, in terms of vacancies, unemployment, and, uh, and tightness, and also in terms of generating a beverage curve. Um, so now, another, so this is um, qualitative, it's giving us a direction of how these variables move over time if you add shock to productivity. 
Now, another more quantitative question uh, arises, which is whether we can actually match um, the amplitude of the fluctuation that we see in the data. That is, if we have labor productivity shock of the size that we see in the data, can we get uh, fluctuations in unemployment and vacancy of the size of what we get in the data? Uh, so let's try to uh, let's try to see whether we can address that question now. 